So good afternoon. My name is Dawn Hammett. I'm the director of the Eisenhower Presidential Library in beautiful Abilene, Kansas. And I am very thankful that you are here with us for this special program that we are providing in partnership with the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Today we have three wonderful scholars with us. Um, I'm going to say their name and then I'm going to let them say a little bit about themselves so that their face pops up on your screen and you see them and not me. First of all, we have Dr. Ed Lingle from the National World War II Museum. Before I let him talk, I need to give him a very special thanks for popping in. Um, one of our uh, speakers at the last minute could not make it, and Dr. Lingle uh, graciously accepted an invitation at the last minute. So thank you. Dr. Lingle, would you introduce yourself, please? Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you again, Dawn. Uh, this is a wonderful series that you're doing. Uh, I'm Ed Lengel. I'm Senior Director of Programs at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans and a military historian. I've written on everything from the Revolutionary War to World War I uh, in terms of books. I've also written a lot of articles for Military History, Military History Quarterly. Uh, and I've always been interested in World War II. Haven't written any books about it yet, but uh, that's always a possibility in the future. Uh, I've also done a lot of work as a battlefield tour guide, including last year having the privilege of visiting the uh, beaches in uh, Normandy and taking groups there, including uh, youth leadership groups. So uh, I'm glad to be with you today. Thank you. We also have with us Dr. Craig Simons from the United States Naval War College. Dr. Simons, can you tell us about yourself, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, you already mentioned I'm the currently the Ernest J. King Distinguished Professor of Maritime History at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, this is the third of my three-year tour there. I spent, prior to that, 30 years teaching uh, history at the U.S. Naval Academy, where I was the History Department Chair. And I've written uh, a number of books, uh, many on the Second World War, including one on Operation Neptune, which we'll be talking about today. I look forward to it. And finally, we have our, we have our own William Snyder. William is our curator at the Eisenhower Presidential Library. William, why don't you tell him about yourself, please? Thanks, Don, um, and thanks to our guests for coming today. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm originally from Northeast Ohio, um, here in Kansas by way of graduate school and some teaching in Illinois, as well as a stint as curator at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. So I am pleased to be here in Kansas, and um, whenever we're ready to get started, we're going to launch into our topic today. Dr. Lingle, Dr. Simons, you all gentlemen are ready? Ready. We are. All right. Um, so we're here today to talk about D-Day plus a few days. Um, so we're a little bit past the successful um, landings on the Normandy coast. And ah, thank you, Troy. Here we go. So um, we have a series of questions that we're going to go through talking about how do we keep the successful invasion going into France? Um, and the project we're gonna look at closely today is the Mulberry Harbor, the Mulberry Project. Um, Dr. Simons, if you'd start us off, please. Where did the idea for the Mulberry Project come from? Well, thank you, Bill. Let me just say, first of all, I'm really doing this topic because it's so easy for students of military history to say, well, here's the map. We draw X's and O's and arrows and explosions and we can find out how things happened. And, Often we don't pay enough time, as much time as we should, to the whole question of logistics. How do you support this? How do you sustain it? And in the photograph you've got on the screen right now showing the what's called the whale, that is the connecting bridge out to the piers in the middle of the artificial harbor, is very much a part of that conversation. So you ask how this got started. Um, interesting question. It really begins uh, early in 1943, a year and a half almost before the invasion takes place, when what was called the Cossack Group, that's Chief of Staff, Supreme Allied Commander, Cossack. It was a fellow British officer named uh, uh, Morgan, Frederick Morgan, and he was sitting around with his advisors saying, well, logistics are going to be a real problem in this invasion. How do we deal with this? And they said, well, we're going to have to get control of a harbor. That's critical. And the nearest harbor is Cherbourg. So the quickest we can get Cherbourg, the better. 
The problem was, what do we do in the meantime? The Germans will defend Cherbourg. They'll probably wreck it on their way out. We're going to need a bridge to get us from the initial invasion to the moment when we have access to a working harbor. And there was a then a brigadier general named John Hughes Hallett in the room, and he said, well, if, if we can't capture a harbor, we'll just have to bring one with us. Everybody laughed. It was a joke. And then somebody said, well, why not? Maybe we can do that. And this is the origin of the idea of creating the component parts of what became the mulberries, the artificial harbors, two of them, one erected off Omaha Beach, one erected off Gold Beach, one in the American sector, one in the British sector, and all of the more than year-long effort that it took to create those. So that's where it started. That's where it started. Wonderful. Thank you. Dr. Lingle? Yeah, and keep in mind, too, that there were other options for invasion beaches, uh, one of them being to land at a port and to try to seize that port. Uh, the Canadians in 42 had landed at Dieppe, and that had ended in disaster. As the Germans knew as well uh, that, for example, landing at the Pas de Calais would have offered the opportunity to seize some of the uh, channel ports right away, but uh, the Germans knowing that had heavily fortified them and they were uh, pretty tall orders to, to attempt to seize, you know, a port right away. So this option of building uh, artificial harbors kind of off, it, it, it allowed other options uh, in terms of which invasion, uh, which invasion beaches to choose. Mm -hmm. Um, and how much uh, did the failure at Dia play into uh, what became the Mulberry Project? Pretty, pretty significantly is, is my understanding. And I'll let Craig speak to this more, but uh, Dieppe was um, fairly heavily defended uh, and the Germans were able to drive the Canadians off with heavy losses. Um, Dieppe was in many ways a dress rehearsal for the uh, attempted cross-channel invasion, and it taught a lot of difficult lessons. There was not going to be another attempt to, to uh, force a landing at Dieppe in any case, but uh, the Pas de Calais being the other more significant option presented many of the same obstacles. Is that a fair assessment, Craig? Yeah, I think it is generally. Uh, I have always wondered in my mind the extent to which um, Dieppe was justified and explained after the fact by arguing that, well, we learned so many lessons at Dieppe that contributed to the success in Normandy. And, and whether this was, in fact, completely true or in part a way to make ourselves feel a little bit better about the terrible sacrifice that the mostly Canadian forces made on the beaches of Dieppe. I'm not really sure. Uh, I think uh, I think Dieppe did uh, help us learn a, a lot of important lessons, including the fact that the landing ships that the British use, called Winstons, in testimony to the fellow in the bathrobe you see on the screen there, and the smaller version called Winnets that could carry tanks and trucks and jeeps to the beach, uh, the failure of those led to the uh, directly to the creation of the LSTs, LCIs, LCTs, and the other more advanced amphibious ships that were used at Normandy. Uh, so there were lessons learned, without a doubt. But I think to a certain extent, too, we, Dieppe was such a bungled operation that to a certain extent, uh, saying that, well, it was justified because we learned lessons, it was simply a way to feel a little bit better about it. Oh, I agree. Dieppe was an unmitigated disaster. There's no question about it, and I don't think any kind of ex post facto analysis could say that it was that it was justified in any way. Uh, the lessons that were learned were painful, but I don't know that the lessons learned at Dieppe necessarily outweighed, for example, the lessons learned uh, in the torch landings, the lessons learned in Sicily and other parts of Italy, uh, as well as in the Pacific. Uh, there were a whole series of events and lessons learned that contributed to to D-Day, and then even then, uh, there were lots of lessons that had not been learned uh, by <laughs> yeah. the time D-Day came about uh, that, that resulted in significant problems. 
That's true too. Absolutely. Um, so we talked a little bit about the the fellows on the screen, and some of them are here. But uh, what did the operational commanders Ike and Ramsey, for instance, and others think of the Mulberry Project? Well, let me start. Um, <clears throat> I think Eisenhower initially thought it, uh, it was a great idea, but but one thing we have to keep in mind is that the Mulberry Project began small and grew like topsy. What Eisenhower originally wanted, if you look at the beach, uh, the beaches at Normandy, they're very gradual. There's about a one foot rise for each 50 feet of horizontal space, which means the low and, and a very high tide so that when at high tide, the beach is quite narrow, and at low tide, it's very, very wide. And Eisenhower worried about getting particularly the tanks, but all wheeled equipment from the low tide mark up to the high tide mark. And he suggested we should build causeways from the landing beaches from the low tide mark to the high tide mark to make sure we can get our wheeled vehicles safely ashore. That's the start of it. And then add to that, well, a breakwater offshore, that would be useful. We'll sink some ships offshore to create an artificial breakwater, and then we'll have these causeways to the beach. But that turned out to be only the first two components of a, a gigantic scheme. By the time it was mounted in 1944, it had grown like topsy, as the phrase goes. And by that time, I think many of the operational commanders had become rather skeptical. Uh, arguing that it absorbed too much money, too much material, too much effort, too much energy. Ramsey referred to them as an abortion. Uh, he uh, complained about those damned mulberries more than once. Um, even Hughes Hallett, whose original suggestion had created it, uh, decided it had become wasteful and ridiculous by the time it was mounted. So. The answer to your question, Bill, is I think they were enthusiastic about it to begin with, and then as it grew larger and larger and more and more complicated, became increasingly skeptical, and some of them just threw up their hands and said, well, this is another one of Churchill's ridiculous fantasies, and there's nothing we can do about it, so I guess we'll just have to live with it. Okay. Ed, would you like to say Well, I just, I'd like to say those are all excellent points. And, you know, these are to the, these and many other points that you make in your, your book, uh, Neptune, Craig, it's very easy with hindsight uh, when we look at this operation, we're, we're kind of overawed by the logistical might that the allies were able to amass. Uh, and, and it's remarkable to, to even recognize that they could even think about this as an option to build their own harbors. But as you, as you point out, Craig, and many times, the, the logistical might that they had still had severe limits. It still had serious constraints. And the ability to assemble enough boats of the right type uh, in particular, uh, as well as other types of ships and other types of equipment was really a, a narrow run thing. They barely had enough uh, of many other types of supplies, but especially ships. And so it, it wasn't as if the planners had an infinite array of um, resources to work with. They had a very fine balancing act uh, to, to undertake. And you can, you can understand, understand the skepticism uh, of some of the planners toward these mulberries. The, the resources that you devote to constructing these harbors means that's that fewer resources that you can devote elsewhere, um, fewer man hours or labor hours that you can devote, devote elsewhere. So it, it was a tight, tight run thing. Um, to kind of follow up, could we be just a little bit more specific? We've kind of touched on this, but what kind of material investment was required to make the Mulberry a reality. Yeah. Yeah, a good slide to show here, by the way. And the short answer to that is a lot. Um, <laughs> first of all, there are several component parts to this program. I, I mentioned already the breakwater idea. And of course, since everything has to have a code name, particularly if it's a Churchill managed project, you have got to have lots of cute code names to put in here. So the, uh, the sunken ships, which were called corn cobs that would be sunk off the beach uh, to form a gooseberry, 
breakwater um, is part of it. And then out beyond that, there's a series of enormous, think of them as kind of pool floats, you know, from the deep end to the shallow end, you sometimes see those pool floats roped together called bomb bombardons that were 200 feet long. I mean, enormous pool floats strung together to dampen the waves before they hit the breakwater. And then inside of that were something called Phoenix units. And that's what we're looking at on the screen, or we were, there we are, looking out on the screen here. These are enormous uh, reinforced concrete buildings, each as big as a six-story office building uh, that would be t built in uh, shipyards, towed by tugs across the channel and then sunk inside the breakwater, uh, but off the beach to form, a, literally to form an artificial harbor. They ended up building uh, 149 of these and they were enormous. They took up a half, I'm gonna have to look at my notes here to get this right, a half million cubic yards of concrete, 30,000 tons of reinforcing iron rebar, 15 million feet of steel tubing and 50 miles of steel wire. So as Ed was saying, if you put, I mean, iron, of course, is a component part of most military weapons in the Second World War. If you put that much iron, rebar, wire, tubing into these, that's material you can't use elsewhere. So again, back to my initial answer is a lot. <laughs> the technical term, yes. It, right. <laughs> Ed, any comments? No, I agree with that <laughs> assessment okay. totally. Well, it's, 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 <laughs> since Ed's gonna, it's, Ed's gonna give me some extra time here, I'll take it Please by do. saying that in addition to, to that, once you're now inside this artificial harbor, not only did they build the causeways that Eisenhower wanted to begin with, the decision was made, well, since the tides go up and down, what we want are floating causeways. So we need to build pier heads designed by an engineer named Lobnitz and therefore called Lobnitz Piers, pier heads out into the harbor. And then these floating causeways that extend all the way from the pier head into the beach. Uh, and again, that too took even more material and was quite an engineering feat. I, I think uh, it's worth congratulating the allies and the engineers who put all this together uh, that they could even come up with this device. Yes, particularly floating uh, six-story concrete buildings across the channel. That's, uh, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. Well, it, it be, and again, that was a problem too, because you need the tugs to pull them there. They're rather heavy. You can imagine that, a six-story concrete building, it doesn't float easily, but you need tugs, ocean-going tugs, and the British simply did not have enough. And although the British had said, we will assume responsibility for the towing mission, they had to turn to the United States and say, uh, we can't do it, we need help. And so the United States committed 25 of its own tugs, but they were harbor tugs. They didn't have the, the towing capacity to pull these big things across. So even at the last minute, they were scrambling around. Here you see one under tow, that's a great, a great image right there. Um, they had to scramble around to figure out how to, how to get the towing capacity to get these across the channel. So, um, perfect segue. So, if we're towing these things across the channel, um, were the Germans surprised? <laughs> uh, again, short answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can't build 179 of these things uh, and, and not have somebody see it. Uh, so yes, they had they had detected that these were under construction. They had intuited what they were probably going to use for, be used for. And in fact, in May, uh, a full month before the invasion, the Germans had their own version of Tokyo Rose. They used a, a, a Englishman uh, who was a German sympathizer named William Joyce, who used to get on the radio and and issue propaganda. And the British dubbed him Lord Ha Ha. And Lord Haha -Ha in May said, we know what you're doing over there. You're building this artificial harbor. You're going to tow it across the channel and you're going to then so on and so on. Pretty much had it figured out. And then said, well, don't worry about the towing part because we're going to sink them before they ever get there. Well, that turned out not to be true, of course, but it does indicate that the British, excuse me, the Germans knew 
what the allies were up to here. It's uh, it doesn't fit in with the Hollywood movie uh, version as you'd like to present. I wouldn't like to do my uh, fake German general accent. You know, we never thought you would you would uh, invade here because we couldn't didn't think you could uh, build any kind of harbors like this, and therefore that they were shocked by the landing of Normandy. Of course, that's totally untrue, and also. The Germans recognized, even with harbors like these, artificial harbors like these, that the Allies were going to continue to be heavily dependent on uh, traditional harbors for bringing in supplies to support the invasion. And that was true with Cherbourg, definitely. Uh, a major part of the invasion design was was put together in order to capture Cherbourg. But even after Cherbourg was captured, even after the harbor was cleared, and that took months uh, to take place, the Germans continued to hold out uh, in little pockets of resistance at French ports all along the coast. In fact, the I believe this is true, correct me if I'm wrong, Craig, the last German units to surrender in the West were German units occupying uh, ports along the western French coast in uh, in Brittany. They held them right to the end of the war uh, and beyond because they knew that they would continue to have a significant impact, which they did on the Allies' ability to supply their drive inland. Well, that yes, absolutely. That and the fact that Hitler told them absolutely no retreating, do not evacuate any location, die in place, die to the last bullet, and so on this military genius that Hitler is often accused of being, his entire strategy consisted of everybody stay where you are and die. Uh, and that's pretty much what they did. So in effect, the Allies bypassed those smaller uh, Brittany ports because once they had Cherbourg in working condition and eventually Le Havre, and the key access, of course, which is Antwerp, once they got Antwerp working, they didn't need anything in Brittany. So they were willing to just leave them hanging out there, blowing in the wind. <laughs> so, um, did the Mulberry work? Um, final assessment. Yes, it did. Um, I mean, it worked in that it functioned exactly the way it was designed to function. Uh, the bomber guns uh, still the waves. The uh, breakwater did more so. The Phoenix did create uh, a harbor. There's a Wonderful photo. Bill, I think you've got it somewhere in your queue because you showed it to mm -hmm. me earlier of uh, ships unloading at the Lobnitz Pier. Uh, and you can yes. see the, the vehicle there. That's it. Coming right off the LSTs. They open those covered doors. They drive right out onto the Lobnitz Pier, which, by the way, rose and fell with the tide. It was on, uh, uh, had floats and could rise and fall with the tide. And then it drove along that artificial roadway, which the Allies called the Whale, and there you see it in two images, uh, all the way to the beach. So it absolutely worked exactly the way it was supposed to. Wonderful. Except so, that, oh, except go ahead. That one of them was uh, destroyed by the weather. Uh, not to well, get ahead of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. and that, that's well, the yes, but, I guess, answer to the question. Yeah, yes, Ed's but. absolutely right. They worked, and then they didn't. So... <laughs> so on uh, so D Day plus three, we have the Phoenixes in place. Uh, D Day plus five, the Gooseberries are in place. And by D Day plus 12, if I'm doing my math right, at Mulberry A, uh, we've got two of the piers in place and um, four pier heads. So multiple offloadings. There's Mulberry A. Thank you, Troy. That's a great shot right there. Uh, here you see the Phoenix yes. units in the foreground, and then, of course, the Lobnitz piers with uh, four, it looks like four uh, Liberty ships or LSTs unloading at the pier heads. Um, yeah, uh, on June, I think it was June 14th when they tried it, first tried it. An LST came in, uh, unloaded uh, at, at the first usable pier head, 27,000 men, 2,000 vehicles, and 8,000 tons of supplies in a single day, which is pretty impressive. Um, but keep in mind, too, that the week before that, the LSTs that had been unloading over the beach by the more conventional amphibious methodology uh, delivered about that amount, about 8,000 tons per day. Anyway, so the differential was relatively small. And then, of course, came the storm. <laughs> 
Yes, so on June 19th, we have this big storm. What was that impact? Ed, you wanna kick this off? Well, just, just broadly, of course, it destroyed uh, Mulberry A, uh, the American uh, Omaha Beach Mulberry and severely damaged Mulberry B, um, the one that was on uh, Gold Beach. Am I getting those right? Right. Um, and left them inoperable. The, the first one, the American Mulberry, was never repaired. It was destroyed beyond, beyond repair. Uh, and elements of that mulberry had to be used to repair the uh, Gold Beach mulberry, uh, which took some time. So fortunately, the beachheads had been consolidated enough by that point that they were, pardon the pun, able to ride out the storm uh, and able to ride out the interruption in supplies. But of course, it uh, inevitably reduced the overall capacity over the long term that they were able to bring in now just with one of the mulberries in operation. And it does suggest something about the, the extent to which the mulberries were essential to Allied success here. If, if with one of them completely destroyed, dismantled, and cannibalized to repair the other, and yet on Omaha Beach, which is the one that was destroyed, where Mulberry A was, on that beach, in the week after the storm, the Allies actually brought ashore an average of 13,000 tons per day, which is 5,000 tons more than they were bringing in when the Mulberry was in operation. And that at least implies that the Allies could have survived without uh, uh, the Mulberries, possibly either one of them, being functional. But, but I think, and this is just an opinion of mine, I think the reason it was important is because because logistics were so central to the success of this operation, the Allied commanders had to know there was a backup, that there was a safety mm -hmm. net, that there was a way beyond the LSTs offloading over the beach, and the mulberries provided that. So even if they weren't literally essential to success, they were essential to the peace of mind of the Allied planners and commanders that they did have a logistic answer to the lack of a working harbor. And right, and, and one thing, let's be clear, the, the mulberries, for all that they did accomplish, they could never replace an actual working port. I mean, an actual working port is many things. It's not just um, a facility for loading and unloading uh, cargo. It, it involves railway facilities, warehouses, storage facilities, um, uh, modes of transport inland, both by rail and road, um, a safe harbor for vessels uh, to to take shelter from from bad weather. Uh, so, you know, the mulberries could do and did accomplish, as you said, Craig, what they were intended to accomplish in the near term. But they could not; they were not themselves ports. And the, the challenge of bringing uh, material off the beaches for all that the engineers did do, and the engineers carry out, carried out heroic work to improve the transport inland from the beaches uh, to further into Normandy, uh, they still could never, um, could never replace a port. And, you know, I don't know over the long term what, what Fig, what the figures are. I don't know if you, you have them, Craig, how much, how important the capture of Cherbourg was relative to the mulberries. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It, it was critical and, and it became increasingly critical because the original Allied plan was to seize Cherbourg within a week. Right. They couldn't do that. It took a couple of weeks. It wasn't really uh, until mid. And then, of course, once they did seize it, they discovered that the Germans had done their usual thorough job of destruction uh, of the harbor facility so that it wasn't until August, now with the landings June 6th, now this is August, before they could use Cherbourg for any large numbers. And it's at that point that finally the large numbers, not just the reinforcements, not just the personnel, but the supplies, equipment, medical ammunition, all of that could be brought ashore in large quantities. And then, as you point out, transported to the fighting front where it was needed. So the seizure of Cherbourg was critical, but it was delayed. And what both 
the mulberries and the LSTs were able to do was provide that logistic stopgap, a logistic bridge between the moment of the invasion and the moment Cherbourg became operational. So uh, we talked about how much went into the creation of the mulberries. Were they worth it? Greg, you should answer that. Well, one. you know, there's no way to know that unless we have a, uh, a test that allows us to try it without them. Uh, it costs an enormous amount. And I'm not just talking about money here. Money, of course, is always a measure of cost, but so too is materiel. And I, I cited the figures early of the hundreds of thousands of cubic feet of, of concrete and steel wire and tubing and all the other component parts that went into it. Plus, of course, the construction of those Lobnitz piers, which were quite complicated in, in engineering terms, and the whale roadways, uh, all of which absorbed uh, hundreds of tons of uh, steel plate, which was one of the bottleneck components of constructing uh, weapons of war. So, so it, the cost was very high. Then we, against that, you measure the value. What was it able to provide? I mentioned that at the very least, it provided um, a state of mind that allowed the allies to say, hey, we've got this figured out. You know, we, we've got a backup here. This can work. Um, on the other hand, I do think that in the years since then, there's been a tendency for us to kind of pat ourselves on the back and say, look how clever we were. Ed pointed out early that in some of the 1950s vintage films about World War II, the, the befuddled Germans are saying, oh, dear, we never thought you'd be able to do this. So how clever was it of us to, to figure out how to bring this artificial harbor across the channel. And of course it was. Did it mean that without that, the invasion would not have worked? I'm skeptical. Uh, but again, as I mentioned at the beginning, we can't measure whether it was worth the investment unless we try it without them. And I'm not willing to do that. Right, they okay. were not, the mulberries were not of decisive importance i don't i don't think there's any any question about that did they contribute something uh yes i think we would agree that they did uh, that kind of cost benefit analysis is always going to be something that's that's undertaken by hindsight uh, they were certainly engineering marvels in their own right uh, you can't take anything away from from the men who designed and built them uh, they were they were remarkable from that point of view. I think in some ways, the better question would be, were they were they a good risk, just from the point mm -hmm. of view of say 1943 and early 1944? Did it make sense from that perspective for the planners to provide this uh, to provide these Mulberry Harbors, you know, in the context of what they saw for the campaign ahead? And no, I, I think it's it's hard to hard to argue. They they had to they had to make some tough decisions. They had to balance resources uh, in a number of different areas. I don't know that we could say that the resources that went into building the mulberries certainly took away resources from other areas. But did it take away resources from vital areas? Did it? Did it hold back in any way the production of ships, uh, for example? I don't think that it did. Mm -hmm. um, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, Craig. So, no, I, th I think from the point of view of, of the planning, it was a creative and um, aggressive and dynamic way to tackle a difficult issue. And, and it's a tribute to the planners that they recognize just how important logistics were going to be. Not not just in mounting the actual invasion, but in sustaining the invasion. Um, and of course, supplies remain an issue. And I believe that supplies were being um, brought from the D-Day beaches right to the end of 1944 and into early 45. Yeah, right through the Battle of the Bulge. That's absolutely correct. Right. Okay. Um, We've talked a little bit about this, and I've got one final question. I think we've almost answered it, though, but um, just some figures that we have used here at the library through uh, or just prior to the storm. The mulberries uh, were responsible for landing 
630,000 troops, 95,000 vehicles, and over 200 tons of supplies. Um, so would you say that that helped save the invasion? It was a contributing factor, it was part of it. Uh, we've touched on this, but um, ultimately did the mulberries save or was it a help? Well, Ed has already given his view about the importance uh, of the mulberries. I'll, I'll take the contrary mm -hmm. position just to be argumentative and say that I think that to a certain extent, it's one of a group of kind of gimmicky weapons that Churchill got his teeth into and didn't want to let go. Now, Churchill was a brilliant and creative individual. It was Churchill's original notion to construct what became the fighting tank. It was Churchill's original idea to create what became the LST landing ship, both of those essential to Allied success in the Second World War. But he also got his teeth into some rather silly things, to be honest. Uh, there was uh, his brother-in-law, I mean, Montgomery's brother-in-law, a fellow named, uh, um, oh, what was his name, uh, Hobart, uh, who was the commander of the 79th Division, Armored Division. And he came up with a whole series of, of tanks with uh, rolling drums on the front that would flail the ground to set off landmines, tanks that would unspool mats, yep. tanks that would uh, act as a bridge so the other tanks could drive over the top of them, what were called the duplex drive tanks that were supposed to be able to swim ashore from three miles out, most of which went straight to the bottom. I mean, Churchill loved the idea of being clever and particularly being clever against the Germans. And, and to a certain extent, I think the whole Mulberry campaign was a, a giant sized version of one of these clever gimmick weapons that uh, he really loved and nobody wanted to get in front of him and oppose, but many of the operational commanders thought it was a pie in the sky and were frankly stunned when it turned out actually to work exactly the way it was supposed to work. Uh, on the other hand, I do think the Allies could have been successful without it. Um, it might have been more of a near-run thing. You already mentioned that it was a very near-run thing, as Napoleon said of Waterloo. Yes. Uh, and so, uh, on the whole, I have to say, as Ed does, good try. And it's not as All right. the supplies that that you listed as having been brought in on the mulberries could not have been brought in otherwise. Um, right. No, they, they would have been brought in whether they would have been able to be landed and taken inland at the same rate, employed at the same rate, uh, is, is another question. Um, no, it's, it's, it's an open, it's in many ways an open question. Uh, and I think it's going right. to take some more some more assessment from scholars i think to look in particular to the months after the invasion heading up to the end of of 1944 uh, and in order to trace exactly where the resources for the mulberries came from where they might have been diverted from to give us uh, a very detailed answer to that question no i would agree it's a, it was a good try it was probably worth trying um from from that perspective uh it it does it does in some ways um highlight another division between the american and the british way of thinking uh militarily uh at this point good point you know they the the british and this is true in in espionage too the the whole kind of the public school ethos of the boy amateur you know the Tom Swift yeah. figure, almost who who comes right. up with these with these wonderful gimmicks to be clever and outwit the enemy is is something that and and also kind of very meticulous planning roundabout approaches uh, to to solving problems is in that period very much in the British way of thinking, and the American way of thinking is let's go straight to the cut to the chase and let's find a a quick and dirty if we need it solution uh the simpler the better um yeah but churchill got his way on this one yeah the americans wanted to use a giant hammer and churchill <laughs> wanted to use a, a little pair of pliers and a screwdriver right <laughs>
<laughs> oh, well, that's great. Well, gentlemen, that's our, our list of questions that we wanted to talk about uh, right now. Um, while our guests get together their questions and send them in by chat, if you all don't mind, I thought we would take a look at our artifact that we have here in the collection of the Mulberry Harbor model itself. Um, Troy, if you could bring those up for us, please. Um, so we have, uh, if you could back up one, Troy, I appreciate it. There we go. Um, this is actually a wall scale mural um, in our galleries. And I just want to read that quote that you can see on there. Um, to solve this apparently unsolvable problem, we undertook a project so unique as to be classified by many scoffers as completely fantastic. It was a plan to construct artificial harbors on the coast of Normandy. Um, that is from General Eisenhower. Um, and our artifact, uh, which is a complete model of one whale and the various pierheads and so forth, also includes this topographical map of how uh, it was planned that they could be installed at Normandy. So this was made in 1943. Um, and Troy, if you want to go ahead and move on to a picture of here we are actually installing the model in our brand new case, um, complete with a D-Day video above, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, and Troy, if you'd go one more for me, please. We can start to see very detailed um, components for this model. Uh, this model itself actually has an interesting history. Uh, there was one created as part of the planning process, we were told, um, that was presented to Winston Churchill. It was apparently briefly at the War Rooms in London. And um, in the fall of 44, following the success of D-Day, um, FDR met with Churchill in Canada for a conference. And at that conference, at a luncheon with um, all of the leaders' wives as well, uh, Churchill actually presented this model uh, to FDR. Um, FDR had already started to build his uh, library at his home in Hyde Park, New York at that point. And um, this model actually went there uh, since it had been given to President Roosevelt. Um, believe it or not, they actually loaned it to us in the late 1960s. And it's been in the Eisenhower Library ever since in multiple configurations and used in multiple exhibits. Um, but we're actually thrilled to have this because it really does help us tell this particular story that we've been talking about this afternoon. And um, it was finally turned over to us by the FDR, um, from FDR library. So it is permanently in our collection now. Um, they gave it to us in the late 90s. So um, Troy, I think we have one more picture of this uh, completely assembled or nearly completely assembled. So again, you can see the component parts. Um, and even as large as that case is, you can see uh, Jeff sitting in there <laughs> trying to put these pieces together. Um, these are not all of the pieces that we have, even as large as the case is, we didn't have room for all of the pieces in the model. So, um, but again, initially there was one created to help plan um, the invasion, uh, at least so we're told. And then this was a second one made and given as a gift by Churchill to FDR. So um, there we go. And there it is finally installed. And uh, it is an integral component to that theater piece um, that talks about both D-Day and getting through to the end of the war. So um, hope everybody will come and see us when we do get to reopen uh, the museum. So um, watch our website, uh, which is right there at the top of the screen. Um, It'll let you know when we get to reopen. Um, so, um, Dawn, do we have any questions queued up? We do not have any questions lined up in the chat box. Um, if somebody wants to type one now, I will pay attention to it. Oh, I lied. So I need to scroll down. We have a lot of people from the Nixon Presidential Library. Isn't that fantastic? Thank you all for coming. That's great. All right, here's a question. 
were there any historical precedents for the creation of a temporary artificial harbor in wartime? Were the Mulberry Harbors the first such attempt? Good question. I, uh, I mean, <clears throat> there are precedents for sinking ships, hulks, as they were known, uh, offshore to still the water for a temporary landing. Uh, this had been done as far back as the age of sail. But of course, what characterized the Mulberry Project was the scale. Absolutely unprecedented in terms of scale, the creation not just of a breakwater, not just of a causeway, but an actual operating pier that would rise and fall with the tide. Uh, that had no precedent. That was new. And I'm thinking in previous wars where amphibious invasions did take place, those usually focused on the capture of a harbor. Uh, of course, my other field is the Revolutionary War when the British uh, invaded uh, North America in 1776. So they had to go for New York uh, because New York gave them a defensible position and a harbor uh, through which they could, they could land supplies. So I don't know that there are any historical precedents of any scale like this. Um, so it is pretty innovative. Thank you. Jim asks, do we have any information on the cost of these two harbors? On the dollar cost? Uh, there probably is information somewhere. I do not have it to hand. Uh, and partly that's because in wartime, the keeping of records, even about things as important as money, are not all that carefully followed. And it fell into several different groups. The Phoenix unit was one uh, cost center and the Lobnitz peers were another and so on. Uh, so somebody would have to go back and dig through all that and add all the numbers together. And I have not done that. Ed, do you know? No, I don't. Okay. We have a question from Troy. Did concentrating on Mulberry divert enough resources that it had a hand in delaying Anvil or Dragoon? The key delay um, that was caused by the Normandy invasion derived from a shortage of the landing ship tank, the LSTs, the alternative, if you would, to the Mulberries. The LSTs were the bottleneck and had been really since the war, uh, since the invasion of Sicily. Uh, they were in demand everywhere. They wanted them in the Pacific, obviously, for landings at Tarawa and Kwajalein and Saipan and elsewhere. They wanted them in the Mediterranean to supply those who occupied uh, Anzio, who tried to conduct the end run around the Gustav line in Italy. Uh, so, and, and of course, they were extremely useful just as a float storage. I mean, they're big, empty, self-propelled boxes that you can put anything in there and just leave in there. You don't need a port. You don't need a crane. So they were very much in demand everywhere. And the problem was that they're, by the time the Allies got serious about the invasion, there just weren't enough of them. So it was the shortage of LSTs that forced the postponement of Anvil slash Dragoon, uh, as well as the cancellation of the invasion of Burma, Anakim. Uh, so there were other projects for which the LSTs were much in demand that were either canceled or postponed because of the LSTs. But it's hard to make the argument that the uh, funding for or the material use of uh, equipment for the mulberry had a had a big role in delaying or postponing those invasions. Can I ask a follow-up question on that, Craig? It's, it's puzzled me for a while from the production standpoint. In a war uh, from the Allied point of view that was characterized by such mass production and production to excess uh, in many areas, uh, production of tanks, production of planes, production of, of so much else is, is awe-inspiring at just how much we produce. So why was it that in this one critical area that must have been recognized earlier, you would, you would think it would have to have been recognized earlier, why were we so short on, on LSTs? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Unfortunately, it has kind of a longish answer, but let me give you the short version of the long answer. There was a priority list put together in the American production scale. They started out with an A1 category, then everybody said, oh, no, mine's more important than that. So it was AA1 and then AAA1. In effect, it was a prioritized list of the most important to the less important tools of war that we need to have. 
And early on, in as late as early as late 1942, and certainly in early 1943, LSTs were very much near the top of the list. In fact, in I think February of 43, they were listed as the number one priority. And then the decision was made to invade North Africa at Torch, and everybody knew that was going to delay a cross-channel attack by at least a year, from 1943 to 1944. So LSTs were dropped down the priority list to number 12. And of course, it's exactly at this time that the U-boat menace became very serious, the end of 1942, the beginning of 43, the crisis moment in the Battle of the Atlantic. And so destroyer escorts, destroyers, Liberty ships, and so forth all got moved up ahead of LSTs. And all of the shipyards retooled themselves to build destroyer escorts and Liberty ships. And then early in 1944, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Combined Chiefs of Staff said, oh, D-Day is back on. We're going to land in Normandy in, in May, that by now, in May of 1944. Oh, my God, we don't have enough LSTs. Move them back to the top of the list, which mm -hmm. they did. But you can't retool a shipyard that quickly. You can't, you know, scrap the destroyer escorts and start building LSTs. The component parts are all different. They have to be manufactured all over the country, shipped by rail to the building site and reassembled. It just took so long that by the time, say, uh, March, April 1944, everything was in full flood, uh, it was almost too late. Typically, let me just give you a couple of numbers here. Typically, the United States could build between 25 and 30 LSTs a month. That's kind of a lot. If you think of LST as a large, ocean-going, complicated vessel, build 25 to 30 a month. But then in March, I'm going to get my numbers. I think in March they built 50. In April they built 82. So they could do it, but that, that ramping up to meet the need came late and almost too late. So I got a very special note about the precedence to um, the mulberry. And the question is, what about Xerxes' bridge of boats in his invasion of Greece? I was just going to say that the examples I can think of date mostly from ancient history. You know, the Romans did this as well off the coast of Carthage. And of course, Xerxes used them. It's not really a harbor. He didn't use it as a harbor. He used it as a bridge. But it's a bridge like the bridge from the Lobnus Pier to the shore. So in that respect, yeah, that's... That's an early precursor. That's, that's a good observation. So we got a question from Yaquan, and he says, um, where are the mulberries now? Are they rescued, or is everything left there? Ah, have you been to Aramash? Have you been stood on the high ground behind Aramash and colville sur mer You can see them. You yep. can see some of them. Anyway, yes. a lot of them, of course, were broken up and lost by the storm. Some that had uh, metal were repurposed. Uh, but you can stand there on the high ground behind the museum at Aramanche and look out there and see, Ed, how many would you say? Eight to 10, 12 maybe of the Phoenix units? Yeah, it's somewhere in that range of about a dozen. Yeah, yeah. you should make the trip, whoever asked that question. And they're now, they're now serving a new purpose of earning tourist dollars for right. the French and Aramanche. Yes. So they make quite a big <laughs> deal about it. Exactly. We got a question from Bill and Mary. They said, did Antwerp become a viable port for supplying the Allied troops? And what was the role of the Red Ball Express? Um, I'm not sure about the last one. We'll come back to that. But the short answer is yes, Antwerp is absolutely essential. In fact, it had been a goal in the uh, planning for Operation Neptune from, from the very beginning, that eventually when Antwerp was captured, all of Normandy and Brittany could be left behind as a backwater because Antwerp could supply the entire Allied army as it moved forward. Of course, the Germans knew that too. And to get to Antwerp, you had to go past the island, the fortified island of Waltern, and up the Antwerp estuary. And all of that was very complicated. So there was a lot of hard fighting, much of it done by the Canadians, uh, to capture that port. But once Antwerp fell, the logistic problems of the Allies were were greatly eased. And that uh, is one reason why the Germans launched the Battle of the Bulge. Their goal was to cut the Allies off from Antwerp so that they couldn't get their logistic support and could be destroyed in, in pieces. So the Red, the Red Ball Express was 
was a very useful supply bridge for a difficult time, uh, running roughly from August to November. Uh, I think August was when it was conceived, August of 44, uh, around the time of the, uh, the Normandy breakout uh, in late August and uh, leading to the liberation of Paris and then going up to the, uh, the capture of Antwerp. Uh, of course, these were, uh, it was a truck supply convoy. Uh, it's called the Red Ball Express because that's how they were marked. Largely African-American drivers uh, who did fantastic work uh, in being able to bring in thousands, many, many thousands of tons of supplies on designated road networks from, from the mulberries, uh, the mulberry at that point, I should say, and from the beaches uh, inland to help su supply the drive toward Paris and beyond and up to the German border. So the Red Ball Express was very important. Uh, it did not it did not totally fill the gap because, of course, by the time uh, the Americans and Patton's troops and tanks in particular reached the German border, they were running out of gas. They were having severe supply issues, but they did as much as could be done uh, in filling an important gap there in the in the autumn of 44. Thank you. Dave has a question. Dave would like to know, how did Mulberry compare to the Iron Horse designed for Tokyo? And could the Germans have run sufficient logistics for Sea Lion? Let me do the second one, and I'm going to let Ed do the first one. Um, sea Lion, I think, was never very serious. Uh, I think Hitler wanted to make sure the, Ger the British worried about it. Uh, he actually did collect uh, some 1,500 of these small Sobel ferries along the coast. Uh, but I think it like almost like Napoleon's attempt to create uh, an invasion scare in 1802, 1803. Um, the idea was to terrify the British rather than actually launch this. I'm not sure Sea Lion was ever a viable uh, idea, unless you believed, as Hitler may have done, that one German division put on the coast of Britain would subdue the entire island. Uh, that might have been true in in the three or four weeks after the evacuation of Dunkirk, but after that, the opportunity, I think, was gone. What do you think, Ed? I think that's a, that's a fair assessment. Uh, if we can, you, you love counterfactuals and hypotheticals as a historian, <laughs> right, Craig? No. I mean, we, can, we can fantasize that if the Germans had been able to carry out Sea Lion, if we can wish away the Royal Navy for a while, which is a big wish, and we can wish away the RAF uh, for a while. Um, you know, I don't know that the Germans would have had to face, once they had effected a landing, resistance on the scale that the Allies had to face in driving into to continental Europe. I mean, and the challenges that the Allies had to face. You know, it's it's one thing to conquer an island which is defended by an army that has basically lost all of its equipment. Uh, if the Germans had been able to get ashore, I think they would have been able to make relatively quick work of the British Army. Uh, and there were no serious shore defenses. But that, again, that's, that's a big if. Uh, but I don't think they would have faced the same logistical challenges. So far as uh, iron, the Iron Horse is concerned, I don't know a whole lot about it, except that it was a projected uh, mulberry-like system for landing supplies in Japan uh, in a prospective invasion in 1945. But there again, um, it's a different animal. Um, the Japanese would have resisted fanatically. Logistics would have been a major problem, no doubt about it. Um, but an island is not the same as a continent. Uh, do you know much about the Iron Horse? Career? I don't. I don't. That's why I left that to you. Thank you for picking that up. <laughs> I do want to make, tell one quick story, though, because I think it amuses. Based on on what you said about the uh, possible success of Sea Lion in in 1803, 1805. Uh, the first sea lord was called to testify before the House of Commons. And they asked him, they were terrified that Napoleon was mounting this invasion and, 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 and could, he, could he actually execute it? And he said, 
I do not say they cannot come, my lord. I only say they cannot come by sea. <laughs> Rather tongue-in-cheek, but I think the same was more or less true in yeah, 1940. I yeah, I agree totally. So we have one more question lined up on the chat. It's from William. So what I would like to do now is see if anybody on the phone has a question uh, before we do William's. And I, William, I'll let you pose your question yourself. If you are calling us from the telephone, I'm going to remind you to do star six to unmute yourself and tell us if you have a question. Sometimes you have to do it twice. I don't understand the technology, but that's a fact. <laughs> Anyone on the phone? All right, William, why don't you pose your question while they determine their needs? Uh, certainly. Um, it really sort of struck me when you were talking about Lord Ha Ha, so thank you for mentioning mm -hmm. him. It's uh, uh, always a, a great historical note, I think. Uh, was there ever any effort to disguise the construction of the mulberries as part of any of the various deception plans that the Allies were putting in place with the various ghost armies and ghost equipment and things like that. I mean, I know these are huge components and all of that sort of thing, but do we know? Well, the British, of course, as I, I think all of our listeners know, uh, did mount this Operation Fortitude, which was this great disinformation campaign. They created uh, fake radio signals emanating from several places where there were supposed to be forces that there weren't. They mm -hmm. created false tanks and false camps and false all sorts of things. Uh, to try to create the the perception that the Pas de Calais and not uh, uh, Normandy was the target of the invasion. And, and so, uh, apropos Ed's, I think, very clever uh, Tom Swiftifying of the British attitudes about this. You know, <laughs> we clever schoolboys will fool those, those literal-minded Germans. Um, so they yeah. did try, yes. I think there were okay. a number of efforts to disguise exactly what was happening. But as you mentioned, uh, it's just such an enormous undertaking that the Germans saw through it pretty quickly. Uh, okay. and, and there was no, not any real doubt in their mind as to what the British were going to try to do, the Allies were going to try to do. Right. So would anyone else online like to unmute themselves and ask a question? I feel as though when we don't have a lot of questions at the very end, it means we've done an excellent job of explaining our thesis. I'd like to dive in with one, one more thing for Craig and one thing that we haven't uh, discussed here, I don't think in any detail, is Pluto, uh, which was so important, uh, the pipeline under the ocean. Uh, to Cherbourg. Uh, do you want to say anything about that? Craig? Yeah, I do. I think of all the sort of gimmicky things, if, if that's an appropriate term, that the guys played uh, at Normandy, how to overcome the unprecedented logistical challenges. Fuel is critical. Fuel is what drives 20th century armies. Uh, it's why the Japanese went to war. It's why they attacked Pearl Harbor to get access to the fuel oil of the South Pacific. Um, and no army can advance without it. Um, so at first, the Cossack planners who put this whole plan, the original plan together, decided, well, we'll ship it over in jerry cans. Well, then they did the math to figure out how many jerry cans it would require. And it was in the tens of millions. I mean, it was just absolutely unsustainable. Well, then we'll use tankers. Well, that not only is dangerous if you, you lose one across the ocean or, and how will you store it once it's assured to create fuel tanks on the beach? I mean, wow, are we going to do this? And the Pluto project, the pipeline under the ocean, even though, of course, the channel is technically not the ocean, but it'll do, um, it is the one thing that did work, I think, and exactly the way it was supposed to. There were artificial pumping stations, uh, not artificial, there were pumping stations created on the uh, channel coast disguised to look like something else uh, that were the origin of these, and the fuel was pumped under the channel. It lasted, I don't know the length of time, uh, it eventually was compromised and they had to use uh, other devices, but by then Cherbourg was open and they could bring it in more conventionally. But like the mulberries, like the LSTs, the pipeline uh, supply of fuel to the beachhead sustained the invasion during that critical moment from first foot on the beach to uh, self-sustaining advance uh, that allowed them to keep going. So that, that was a genuine contribution. I'm glad you brought it up. 
Thanks. I thought it was. Yes, helpful. thank you, Ed. That's it is. Well, I have one question for for both of you. Um, at the Eisenhower Presidential Library, we are always seeking ways and opportunities to share these stories with a younger generation, a generation who doesn't have um, a personal connection to this history. What do you think we should do to highlight um, this particular aspect of the story for a, a different group of people? You wanna take that first, Craig? Sure, I think you're doing it. Uh, I think, I mean, I, I love William's presentation of the, the Mulberry display. Uh, and I think that's the kind of thing young people, I know when I was young and I had a model train like young boys often do, and, and the idea of having that model of what it was, they can look at it, get close to it. In a perfect world, of course, they could touch it and play with it, but I understand why that's probably not on. But I think exactly oh. that kind of thing uh, is what would entice and track, uh, attract and uh, encourage uh, young people to think about, well, what was this and how did they do it and so on. So I think having that model in place is an absolutely wonderful first step. Thank you very much. I agree you. that you are, you are doing it. You're doing great things with these, with these webinars. Um, I think a key too is to kind of uh, take young people where they are um, as they are and the challenges that they face and draw a connection. And the example I would give of that is a leadership group that I took over to Normandy a few years ago of, um, of young people. Yes, we went to the beaches, we went to some of the battle sites uh, from the initial landings to fighting inland, but we also went up to Cherbourg. And one of the leadership modules we, we did was to look at a heroic story, which I think has largely been untold of civilian engineers who were brought over from stateside to rebuild this harbor, which had been totally destroyed, very efficiently destroyed by the Germans, to try to open it up for, um, you know, for use again. And and the work that they did was remarkable. And it's it's a great leadership lesson, if you think right now of the challenges that young people are facing and are going to be facing uh, with the economy in trying to rebuild the economy. I think you can look at lessons, you can look at lessons of the construction of the mulberries, of, of Pluto, of all of the, the hard work and the innovation that goes into this and to say, you know, here are some concepts and some ideas that really can be useful for you right now. Uh, I think that that's one of the best ways to, to reach them. Thank you. Well, since we have no more questions, I would like to tell all of our guests about our upcoming programs. Our next program is the monthly Lunch and Learn, which will be on Thursday, June 25th at noon Central Time. We're in Central Time. Our guest for that Lunch and Learn program will be Elise Wilson. Um, she is one of the, um, there we go, here's it coming. Uh, Elise is one of the guides, the park guides, at the Eisenhower National Historic Park in Gettysburg. And Elise will be telling us about uh, Eisenhower's um, life there in Gettysburg. I'm really looking forward to that. Also, I need to say a very special thank you to the Eisenhower Foundation. Of course, it is only through, the Eisenhower, through support of the Eisenhower Foundation that we are able to, to perform and produce programs like this. And the Eisenhower Foundation got sponsorship from the Union Pacific Foundation for our public programs for this year. And Samantha also showed us a slide that I overlooked for our next book club meeting. Our next book club meeting will be in July the 14th. And the book we'll be discussing is The Alice Network. And frankly, if you haven't read it yet, I recommend that you do. It's an excellent book. So gentlemen, that seems to be the end of our program. I'd like to thank you for your time today. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Enjoyed it very much. Good to see Ed and, and uh, everybody else. What a pleasure, everyone. Thank you. Y'all have a great day. <laughs>